This is going to be an amazing video. I'm very proud to have an ATF federal agent, Agent John. Welcome to the channel, John. My pleasure. Pleasure. Glad you flew here from Colorado Springs down to Fort Lauderdale, and you're going to be a regular on the channel. This video is an open video to the President of the United States and to every politician in America about how to stop gun violence without gun control. 20-year gentleman, pro-gun, who's been in the field, who's been part of Waco, who's been part of the movie theater shooting, this gentleman, John, federal agent, is going to give us tips. I always bring the best of the best to this channel. John, like I said, it's a pleasure to have you here. We have a federal agent. Let me ask you this, and please, please talk to everybody. What were the five most intriguing things you've done in your career, one at a time? Well, probably the most intriguing thing I've done in my career would be developing the crime gun intelligence strategy for the nation. And explain that, please. Well, basically, it was a concept of how to make law enforcement work better to address actual gun violence as opposed to targeting the gun. The approach was totally to just target the shooter, the actual person committing the crime. And by doing that, it makes police more efficient and it reduces gun violence because we all know gun control doesn't work. So, yeah, we're going to talk about this in detail in this video, but you do believe gun control does not work and you have strategies, specific strategies. Like I said, this is going to you, Mr. President. This is from an ATF agent going to you and you have strategies we're going to talk about that you feel will curb gun violence, mass shootings, and all the problems we have in America with guns, correct? Yes. Two. Number two, what was another intriguing thing you've done as an ATF agent? Uh, the Aurora Theater shooting. Oh, gosh, that must have hurt. I know you can't talk about it too much because there's a lot going on with that shooting right now. Uh, I believe there was about 170-some people shot. Right? It, was, it was a bad crime scene. It was a horrific crime scene, to say the least. Yeah, of course, you were there. Oh, well, just, just without being specific, tell America, was it the gun's fault? Whose fault was it? As always with any shooting, um, guns don't get off the table and go shoot themselves. It's the individual committee pulling the trigger who's committing the crime. And that's the biggest thing we really have to refocus and make sure everybody understands. Guns don't commit crimes. People commit crimes. Okay, we're going to elaborate that more in a moment. Another thing intriguing in your career... Uh, Oklahoma City bombing case. Okay, now that, if you guys are old enough to have lived through it, I know I, I, was, uh, I was younger then, and um, I remember, boy, I remember that day. And you told me a couple of things before we went on camera here about that. Uh, explain one of the situations where you walked up um, and interviewed someone who was actually sitting at their desk, and they had four people on the other side of the desk. Those four people died in the bombing and the lady on the other side lived and explained how the building dropped and all that and and of course the psychopath who did it. Well, Tell Timothy McVeigh that. blew up the building using a fertilizer bomb. It was a large fuel-driven bomb with diesel fuel and fertilizer. And when you first got there, the most amazing thing is you didn't realize the building was rectangular. You thought it had a curve in it because it had actually taken a big ice cream scoop out of a seven-story building. And it looked like the building actually had a little curve in the front of it, but that's actually where the blast occurred. It was probably one of the most horrific times of my life to see that much death and destruction. And to, when you talk to those people who lived through that, it's just hard to relate to them because their life's changed in a split second. Because when that bomb went off, it cracked every floor in that building with a little push up. And then when the top floor actually cracked all the way and came down, it started a little pancake maneuver where it started going bam, 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 all the way down, crushing people as it went down and killing everybody in the building. Yeah, so that was one of the most horrific things you've lived through in your life. Yes. As a federal agent. And, well, I, you know, I'm very proud to have you on the show, of course. You'll be here again in the future. And this is a privilege for all, all of us. So, one other thing, uh, were you part of Waco? Yes. Let's tell us about Waco. Now, if you're not old enough to know about Waco, what's a brief overview? Mine would be pretty brief because I got shot right off at the beginning on the original <laughs> raid. So, uh, you well, know. No, wait, 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 wait. Did you guys go in there and burn that place down? Did the ATF burn that place down and come up? No. <laughs> no. We were already gone. <laughs> we were gone by that point. The FBI had taken the entire crime scene over. Um, it, was, it was a horrific day. 
And the reality of it is, it took me a long time to be able to admit that. But once we lo lost the element of surprise, we really should have called off the raid. That was a mess. That was a mess. And people, as we always call it, the creature was alive. And everybody thought they could still do it. Because at the time, nobody had ever ambushed law enforcement before. That had never happened in the history of law enforcement. So nobody really assumed it w would. So the saddest reality of it is when you look back now, we were actually fulfilling their own pro prophecy. By doing what we did, we actually played into their hands. And it's a sad statement, but we didn't understand the mentality of it. Uh, everybody was still going off Jonestown, and you have to be a lot older to remember that. But it wasn't until years later when people really started looking at Jonestown and realized it really wasn't as much of a mass suicide as a mass murder. Correct. Because after the first few people drank the Kool-Aid, everybody said, hey, wait a second, this isn't a joke anymore. Stevie well, just died. I don't want to drink the Kool-Aid now. Unfortunately, we were under the mentality this was going to be just a mass suicide and not a mass murder, and we really didn't anticipate what happened. And that's just the sad reality of it. So in Waco, I forget the psychopath's name, he was in control of those people. Do you remember his name? Uh, uh, David Koresh. Okay, yeah, that's right. And he ultimately burned his own people to death. Right. Correct. All right, so you've had a lot of history in your career as an ATF agent. You're pro gun? Yes, very much so. Of, the, of, uh, of all the ATF agents you've worked with through your career, how many, what percentage would you say are pro-gun? To the point that they have multiple guns and love guns, well over 90%. Yeah, see, so that's, that's, that's great because I think it's the politicians who are telling the, you know, these agencies you know, the wrong things to do. May, may, I'm right or wrong, but you know better than me, of course. I mean, they're pro-gun. So why is the ATF trying to take our green tipper away? Why is the ATF you know, trying to do this, that, and the other against us pro-gun guys? You're a pro-gun guy. You just said 90% of ATF is pro-gun. So what's the scoop? And just tell everybody, please. Well, mainly I think what happens is a lot of times they do stuff and don't realize that it's going to be misconstrued or mistaken. And they need to put a lot more thought in everything they do. Because when they do things, it fuels the fire that people are trying to take people's guns. So when you do anything in ATF, you really need to slow down a little bit and make sure you put a lot of thought into it because there's a lot of people out there who are very nervous about gun control. So what you don't want to do is make those people even more nervous. And I think that's one of the things ATF really needs to learn is let's take a look at what we're about to do and let's don't, let's don't light a fire behind us for no reason. That's wonderful to hear from an ATF agent and knowing that 90% of ATF, ATF agents actually believe from what you told me earlier, they feel what they feel what you feel, right? Right. There's some that don't love guns, but you know, I grew up in Texas, and I was, you know, and anybody who's watching the show from Texas knows the old joke: "How many guns do you have?" And I go, "I don't know. I'm from Texas. I have no clue how many guns I have." <laughs> yeah, and it's not just that we love guns; we just love our Constitution, of the United States. We love our Second Amendment. We're Americans. We don't want our freedoms taken away. Right. And and the ATF. You being ATF, you don't want to take our freedoms away, no, correct? No, not at all. And that's what that's the. You know, it is a nice breath of fresh air to talk to John. Okay, now we have to focus right now on how to stop gun violence. We recently, at the time of this video, had a mass shooting, people dead, and then of course before that we had the horrible school shooting, and then before that we had the, the movie theater shooting, and then it was a, the, first of all, this is going to happen regularly. It's I hate to say it, it's it can't be stopped. I don't know how often, but it's going to happen again. I've, I've been saying this for years, and it does happen again. There's psychopaths out there. So how do we stop gun violence? How do we stop not only the mass shootings, but even more importantly, John, the question is, how do we stop all the murders on a daily basis? Well, you have to pay attention. Please uh, talk to everyone, and this is an important question. How do we stop all the murders on a daily basis? Plus, how do we stop mass shootings? The number one thing to stop gun violence in this country, and especially the murders, is to identify the people who are shooting guns every day and get them off the streets. The reality, and a lot of people don't know this, is most shootings don't get investigated. When I say most, I mean the vast majority of shootings never have a detective assigned. There's never follow-up investigation. None of those things occur. This is because homicides become the number one priority for law enforcement, and the only thing they really focus their efforts on is homicides. Because we, we want to have a really good solve rate on homicides. But the reality is most shootings, when you hear about a drive-by shooting of a residence, shots fired in an alleyway or anything else, they're really attempted murders. People are shooting at somebody, and when you hear about it's not a murder, it's just an aggravated assault with bodily injury, that's either because of sight control or sight picture or just good medical care. 
So shootings are actually up and law enforcement isn't paying attention to them because they're being pushed to focus all their efforts on homicides. That's a good point. So if the, if the feds, uh, we don't want the feds stepping in into, into our lives in any way, shape or form, but if they could somehow possibly stop murders and they can take the federal government's money and curb it more towards investigating shootings before people get killed, investigate shooters who are doing you know, scary tactics. You used a good example earlier to me. You got a bully pushing a kid down the stairs in school over and over and over and over, and he doesn't get in trouble until the kid breaks his neck. So you know, he breaks someone's neck. So I guess elaborate on what you're saying, because that's a huge point on how the federal government can tell law enforcement, use this money to go after shooters in general. Can you well, please rephrase it? Well, in, in Denver, we've already implemented the strategy with our Crime Gun Intelligence Center. And what we really did was make sure that every shooting gets attention. Um, again, like I said, if it's a shots fired, uh, drive-by shooting, no detective ever gets assigned. If it's an aggravated assault with bodily injury, a detective might only investigate for three days. The only focus was murders. Now in Denver, since we've changed that strategy, you know, and thank you to Chief White from Denver PD for helping us do that, Every crime, every shooting is treated as a serious event. We actually make sure detectives follow up the next day. We make sure that somebody picks up the shell casings and we put them into a database called NIBIN where we can compare shootings to shootings and suddenly we identify, hey, this gun, shell casings from one particular gun have been used in seven shootings. We really need to crack down on this guy. He hadn't killed anybody yet, but it's not for not trying. I mean, he's shot at people seven times. Reality is right now in most cities around the United States, no one is assigned to a drive-by shooting of your residence unless you're in the nice part of town. So what we really have done is basically, I hate to tell, tell you this, in Denver we're doing what you thought we were doing anyway. It's, it'd be great to brag about this as a novel concept, but most people who are involved in any kind of database management or prevention are going, well, this doesn't sound that dynamic. But when you travel the nation, you realize most law enforcement has put all their effort towards solving a murder. Well, that, that crime's already occurred. But the reality is most of those kids have committed other shootings before then. They're not great shots. we got to get in front of them. That's, that is such common sense, and that is such a powerful message. And Mr. President, Mr. Politician across America, please listen. Governors, mayors, everyone with any political strength to change if, if you want to change laws, I don't have a problem with laws being strict on people who have sh shot at people. It's already against the law, of course, to shoot people, but maybe we have to, to, I guess, spend the money on investigating these people more in detail. Well, and that's a really a great point, because the reality is when you look at what happened in New York City back in the 70s when they were having like 2,700 murders a year, and you think about, well, they passed all these gun control laws, the reality is... Mayor Giuliani actually made his police department focus on every shooting as a serious crime. Every crime was a crime. It is a novel concept. But what he did was make it a crime to shoot a gun, and if you shot a gun in that city, there was a consequence to it as opposed to just ignoring it until he kills somebody. Those same gun laws exist today in Chicago, uh -huh. and you see Chicago out of control. So Chicago does not enforce laws that are in place to investigate shooters. Am exactly. I right? Exactly. Yeah, this is huge. You know, listen, Chicago, you get more people killing each other there than anywhere, pretty much, and they're not going after these people shooting each other. They're waiting until they're dead. Well, and it's the funniest thing is what I've given, I've traveled the nation. This is a national strategy I've developed for Department of Justice and ATF, and we're spreading around the nation right now. And I've gone into many chiefs of police to talk about this issue. And they don't even know that there's no detective assigned to a drive-by shooting. They don't <laughs> I, even I didn't know, know that. That's they didn't know that a detective will only keep an aggravated assault with a bodily injury open for one or two days before he closes it. It's a joke. It's a because joke. he's getting more cases thrown on. I'm not blaming law enforcement, but if you think about it, if you're a mayor or city council, the number one thing you're trying to keep down is crime stats. There you go. Well, and they don't want to admit when crime is bad because it affects your tax base and other things. But when we ignore these crimes, it allows the false belief that guns are the problem. We must insist that gun violence is addressed and don't talk to me about gun control when you're not addressing gun violence. That is amazing. you got a Facebook page. I'm going to put your link below. You speak regularly about your, uh, these topics and on how to 
how to change gun violence without adding more gun laws. We have enough gun laws. We need less gun laws. Uh, I think you're phenomenal. Everything you speak about. Do you have anything else you want to add? John? Well, I, 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 you're here on the set, and it's just a breath of fresh air talking to a federal agent. By the way, what's it like? Are you like a Jack Bauer type guy? No, come no, on, no. Come it's, on. it's it's. I get a lot of typing. What kind of gun carry? A Glock. A Glock. Okay, I like Glocks. I, I, we used to carry six, but to save the taxpayers' <laughs> money, we transitioned to Glocks, and they're great guns. I have nothing bad to say about. You're a good shot. You practice regularly. I practice regularly. I mean, I, I know some guys who are just phenomenal shots, so I hate to ever call myself a good shot. I'm around some phenomenal shots. All right, so back to what we're saying. Uh, so what would you like to add? I mean, uh, you've got your Facebook page down there. Please go like his Facebook page. Check it out. I mean, you're writing some really powerful articles. I know the White House is watching you closely on a positive note because you are one of the few people in America who are coming up with positive ideas on how to curb gun violence without getting more gun laws. Well, and, and there's no reason. I, I wish the people out there who really push gun control would understand just a few things. One, there's this crazy thing that our founding fathers created called the Second Amendment. So you can't do it. So just move on. Number two, the barn door has been open for such a long time. There's so many guns out there. What are you worried about? There are we have plenty of guns. You're not going to pull our guns back. Guns last forever now. They're a lot higher quality than they've ever been. I've still got guns from my great-grandfather, and they function. Oh, yeah. And I tell you right now, they're not as made as well as today. But really, the most important thing is when you talk to people about gun control and they try to push this stuff on you, you got to look at them and say, hey, listen, the reality is, if one, if you really try to do a gun grab, it's going to cause a civil war in this country, plain and simple. I just heard a federal agent tell us, we all heard it, Elaborate on that. Well, civil war. I mean, it's not. It's it, not a conspiracy theory. I tell you what. There, everyone wants to come after my guns. I know if I do a video, I'm not. You know, I'm not going to try to start a civil war. But it's going to go to a lot of people, and that's going to go on social media, and it's going to go to millions of people, to millions of people, to millions of people, and it could get people pretty upset. And, elaborate on that. And civil why? War. And why even feed that fury? Because here's the reality: Who are you going to get to do the gun grab? Because 90% of law enforcement, if not a lot more, believe in the Second Amendment and believe in the right to bear arms. And I guarantee you, 100% of the U.S. military has guns, and they believe in the Second oh, Amendment definitely. and the Constitution. Yeah. So even the commanding officers. So, guys, when you push gun control, all you're doing is fanning the flame and, sh and shaking a bottle to see how much fuzz you can get to come out of it. Don't do it. You're talking don't, to politicians. Don't do it. The reality is, let's address the actual problem, which is gun violence and shooters who are on the streets today. If we can get people to just admit that we're not addressing gun violence, I tell you, the biggest thing I like to bring up, if you have a choice of addressing a young man who's under 25 who's out shooting a gun at people, and you have the choice of addressing his violence before a homicide, and you can lock him up for 60 days to six months for shooting a gun at somebody, or you have the other option. We're going to wait till he murders somebody. Now I'm going to drop him in prison for the next 30 years. And I'm going to leave a black hole where he was because it's going to destroy his family. Plus, there's also the black hole where he shot and killed somebody. Don't think just because we've heard it our entire life, well, it's just thug shooting thug. No, no one deserves to go to bed to the sound of gunfire. Everyone deserves to live in a safe community, and we must address gun violence. It's not the gun. There's plenty of guns out there. We don't, it's not about bringing more guns in or taking guns away. It's about focusing on the one thing. People who are shooting guns illegally in cities need to be punished for that. And it's not happening today. That is so powerful. And the people who are breaking laws need to be addressed when, by their parents, when they're youngsters, when they're teenagers. Because when they become 18, you know, then they're... A charge as an adult, and these kids, they just don't get it these days. You know, when I, it. Well, you and I are about pretty much the same age, when we were kids, you know, what was the worst thing we did? We threw eggs, you know, on Halloween. Oh, and toilet paper. Don't oh, don't the toilet yeah, paper. Yeah. Well, we took a sock and filled it with, with the, I remember I used to take a sock and fill it with the powder and, and hit guys with it, you know. Like, right. You know, silly stuff. You know, now these kids, you know, they're throwing Molotov cocktails and burning houses down and doing crazy stuff. These people need to be put into their place at an early age 
and stop all this violence. Well, just think, if, if you, if today we had this discussion earlier, if you had a choice of what you want law enforcement to focus on, would you rather them focus on people who are out shooting a gun today, or street level drug buys, or let's say a convicted felon with a gun, or people buying guns who don't have a proper FFL license, or who are buying and selling guns illegally? To be honest, the only thing that really should be the number one priority for law enforcement is people who are out shooting guns at people every day. Shooting and, guns at people. And they're committing violent crimes. And if we can yeah. get people from ATF to all of law enforcement to put all their energy toward that, suddenly you could see a big dip in homicides, murders, and gun violence. Hey, people, it's costing you all money. Whether you think it or not, you're paying for these prisons when these people commit murders. And you're also paying for all the medical care when they're wounding people. Yeah, and I also think it also goes back, like I said, the parents and morals. Let's get the country back to morals. When we were kids, and you know, I remember, you know, we had block parties and we all, you know, we had church on Sunday and we had morals. Uh, my family still does. Your family still does. But a lot of families in America has lost that. Right. They just lost the. They lost the family value of sitting together as a family at dinner, sitting around a, a table of, of four to two children, two parents, and. You know, saying a little prayer and talking and having a normal dinner, doing homework, going to bed, you know, instead of just go sit on the computer to your children and, you know, right. when they're 10. We, we need to go back to family morals. I just came up with that. I just... No, it, you're exactly yeah. right. And we, we can't... I mean, I, I think these mass shootings are tragedies, and insane people will always do insane things. They will figure out a way to do a horrible thing no matter what you do. So even if, they're, even if you did... They couldn't get to a gun, they would find a way to do something hideous and horrible. Trust yeah. me, that's going to happen. Uh, but those are distractions, and they're used as a way to promote gun control. What would you like everyone to write in the comments now? They're going to be on your Facebook page. Uh, they're going to see some of your publications you've written. You have 200,000 views and, um, by people in the White House. I know that. You're a very well-known author. Uh, what would you like them to write in the comments about how to stop gun violence without more gun control. What would you like them to write in the comments that they that share with everybody else? That they, they spoke with their local police department and finally found out how many people are being devoted to following up on shootings in their area, as opposed to how many people are assigned to do auto theft or property seizures or street level drug buys. You'd be amazed at where the resources of your PDs are being devoted. And the PD wants to do what I'm talking about. They want to go out and catch the bad guy. Most cops are sheepdogs. And they want to go out and catch that wolf. And there's nothing, there's not a worse wolf out there, really, than somebody who's out, out shooting up a community. So you need to reach out to your own police department politely and ask them. We started this process in New Haven, Connecticut, and it worked great. They were actually able, the chief was actually actually meeting with families where their young boys were involved in shootings. And how impressive is that, that the chief's going to take the time to go try to stop this kid before he murders somebody? He might not be able to lock him up, but we get him off the streets. Yeah, well, they do have some horrific, horrific laws in Connecticut. Let's not right. go there. Right, but, but they still yeah. have tons of guns. There's yeah. tons of guns there. Yeah. And Memphis has 50 less murders a year than Chicago. And we're starting that process there, and the PD is already seeing results. Mm -hmm. Look at what Denver PD has done, and it is actually affecting real gun violence, not just homicide. This is a subject we need to continue talking about on this channel, and we will. I'm glad to bring you an expert, someone uh, 20 years experience, as, as a federal agent. And uh, also I want to mention he's wearing a shirt called CCW Safe. And if you, if you remember, CCW is a company I spoke about and John and I are both affiliated with. And that is your card that you keep in your wallet, your attorney. You shoot someone in self-defense, you need an attorney. And it's kind of like prepaid legal. I'll put a link below to a video I did previously all about that. 75 bucks a year. You need to have that card, heaven forbid, you have to shoot someone in self-defense. You don't want to say too much to police, and then you just say, here's my attorney. And you keep that next to your license to conceal the gun and your driver's license, and then you're good to go. But back on focus here, it's a pleasure, sir, to have you on my this pleasure. show, and you'll be back. Powerful, throw your comments in. We covered a lot here. Thank you, Tom from Weapons Education. Share this, everybody. Share this everywhere everybody please thank you thank you